Hello and welcome to the Business Standards Morning Show. I'm Kanishka Gupta and let's have a look at the stories for the day. What the world needs now is people who see flight a little bit differently. Because seeing a better connected world isn't far in the future. We're building it now. GE, building a world that works. After missing disinvestment target for three years running, will the government be able to nail it this financial year? Well, it has a good head start as LIC stake sale added over 20,500 crore rupees to the exchequer. So will the just approved sale of the government's remaining stake in Hindustan Singh help it meet its disinvestment target of 65,000 crore rupees? And how are things progressing for the centre's overall disinvestment and privatisation plans? Let us know all this in our next report. The Cabinet Committee on Economic Affairs has approved the sale of the government's entire remaining stake in Hindustan Zinc Limited or HZL. According to the closing price of the company's shares on Thursday, the sale of the entire 29.5% stake would fetch around 37,400 crore rupees. As reported by Business Standard, an official has said that the government might sell its HZL stake in tranches through an offer for sale or OFS. So far, in the current financial year, the centre has collected 23,575 crore rupees in divestment proceeds through the Life Insurance Corporation of India IPO and the offer for sale of Oil and Natural Gas Corporation. If the centre successfully carries out the divestment of HZL, it will find itself in striking distance of its 65,000 crore rupees divestment target for financial year 2022-23. This is good news, especially given the uncertainty surrounding the government's plans due to Russia's invasion of Ukraine. But we need to dive a little deeper. After setting ambitious divestment targets in the last three years, the centre in Budget 2022 pegged the FY23 target at a conservative 65,000 crore rupees. The pandemic and the Ukraine war have hampered the centre's divestment and privatisation plans in recent months. In April, the centre missed its revised divestment target for the second time in three years, even after slashing it by 55% to 78,000 crore rupees in the union budget. Compared to the target, the FY22 divestment mop-up was 13,530 crore rupees, which included the 2,700 crore rupees received by the centre from Air India's privatisation. So, what does the relatively better performance this year mean for the government? So, this particular decision to look at Hindustan Zinc, I think, has been uh, something I would say which was a kind of a blessing for the government. Because from the numbers which we are reading about, we're really talking about something of uh, over 30,000 crores, which is going to be mobilized, which will take us very much closer towards the overall disinvestment target of 65,000 crores. So the way I look at it is it's quite possible that the government may also exceed this target. This may not be the only disinvestment or the only large disinvestment which the government is talking of. But if you're able to uh, complete this within a time span, they could definitely be looking at other companies also to disinvest so that they would be uh, crossing this target of 65,000 crores and probably move also probably towards a target of something like 1 lakh crores. Now, in fact, I think that they will exceed it. And the reason I'm, I'm emphasizing exceeding the 65,000 crores, of course, achieving it itself is uh, going to be uh, quite uh, uh, useful for the government, is because in this particular year, we are talking in in terms of certain kind of revenue slippages which we are aware of, something like the excise duty cuts which have taken place for edible oil as well as for fuel. So there is a certain hit which is being taken by the exchequer. At the same time, there are certain additional expenses which are also being incurred by the government. And in this kind of a situation, there has been talk about whether it's going to affect the overall fiscal arithmetic. 
Now, when I look at interest on zinc and saying, okay, we're coming close towards the 65,000 crores mark, and I'm going even beyond saying that if the government is really encouraged by this, they could also keep looking in terms of uh, going in for disinvestment of other companies too, so that you can partly compensate for uh, the loss of uh, revenue on account of the excise duty cuts. And also it would help to support the additional expenditure which you're talking about. And this gives a lot of confidence. I think that's more important because we've never had this situation where in the first couple of months, we are very close to the disinvestment target. So I admit that Hindustan Zinc will be run over a period of time. However, the government has had a bumpy ride as far as privatization is concerned. In the case of Central Electronics and Pavan Hunts, the nearly completed privatization transactions have hit a roadblock because of the winning bidders having pending legal cases against them. On Thursday, the government announced that it has withdrawn its offer to sell its entire 53% stake in BPCL. It said that majority of bidders have expressed their inability to participate in the current privatization process because of the prevailing conditions in the global energy market. And according to news agency PTI, the government is on course with the privatization of two public sector banks, Central Bank of India and Indian Overseas Bank. It is also planning to sell indirectly held stakes in ITC and Axis Bank. And it is also trying to complete the sale of Shipping Corporation of India. Strategic disinvestment of Container Corporation of India is also lined up. Now, in terms of privatization, I would tend to believe that the government will go slow on it because privatization means we're changing the total ethos of a company from a public sector to a private sector. So it would mean uh, taking all the stakeholders along. So while for something like Air India, which was a clear-cut case of uh, privatization, there were all other compelling factors which sort of nudged the government to be more aggressive to go out with a deal, which was a win-win situation, but a thing which had to be done. But, but I don't see a similar thing looking at uh, other PSUs, which are actually doing well, because when we're talking in terms of maybe the public sector banks, which was spoken of earlier, or you're talking of an OMC. These are companies which are very, very good, which are doing very well, prosperous companies. So therefore, the situation is quite different from that of Air India. And it needs to change this case of change of mindset. We also need to change the ideology and then take in all the stakeholders' interests before you go in for it. So that, to my mind, will still take some time. It's very difficult for a government to get privatization right especially in a context where there's a semblance of democratic accountability. The reason that full privatization is very difficult to accomplish is that it's difficult to get the valuation right. And for getting the valuation right, you have to get the timing right as well. You have to ensure that the credentials of the uh, prospective owners are duly verified, the necessary due diligence has been carried out. The state capacity to take care of all these things uh, is, I'm afraid, somewhat limited in a country such as India's. And that is the reason that the government has opted for a more modest target of privatization in 22-23 compared to the one in 2021-22. It doesn't point to any lack of political will for reform, as critics are apt to think. It is more a recognition on the government's part of the constraints to privatization in the Indian context. And this investment sort of commends itself to the government because there you can say when you sell in tranches, there's a better chance of getting the price discovery right. Because even if you get it wrong in the first instance, you can get it right over a long period of time. Moreover, when you sell in tranches, you're giving the enterprise a chance to improve its performance by being subjected to market discipline and therefore there's a better chance of getting the valuation right. So, does it look like the government has decided to follow Infosys's philosophy of under-promise and over-deliver? listed तुझे फाइव पैसा नहीं पता? अब तो सबको पता है। फाइव पैसा पर है चार हजार स्टॉक्स की रिसर्च, टेक्निकल टूल्स और इन्वेस्टमेंट आइडियाज। डाउनलोड फाइव पैसा नाउ। अब तो सबको पता है। इन्वेस्टिंग मेड इजी एंड रिपोर्टिंग विद फाइव पैसा। इन्वेस्टमेंट्स इन सिक्योरिटीज मार्केट आर सब्जेक्ट ट
The war is indeed putting governments in tight spot by continuously feeding into inflation. And if it doesn't end soon, we may witness food crisis in parts of the world. Those with a large population are more at risk. So do we need another green revolution to boost food production and save us from Thomas Malthus prophesy? Business Standard's Ishan Gira explains it to us. The Russia-Ukraine war has sent commodity prices soaring across the world. While some countries are halting exports to bring down inflation, others are rethinking their agricultural strategies. India put a ban on wheat exports to contain domestic prices just a few days after Indonesia placed a similar ban on palm oil, only to relax it later. Some even call it deglobalization as food protectionism has been rising across the world. And it may further fuel global inflation. So is the world's food production keeping pace with the rising population? Let us begin with the 1798 essay by Englishman Thomas Malthus. Malthus had said that population growth would outpace food production to cause shortages and famine. Though not the first grim theory on population, Malthusian catastrophe was widely debated and criticised too. Two years later, in 1801, the UK government went on to conduct the first census. Malthus was proven wrong. But the theory again found resonance during the 1960s when newly independent countries wanted to be self-sufficient in food. The reason was not as much population sustenance, but freedom from the shackles of dependence. India's Green Revolution was a step in that direction. But times changed. Decades of peace and globalization prompted most countries to liberalize trade rules for food commodities. For instance, the rice trade increased 22% between 2014 and 2022. Trade in wheat is expected to increase between 2017-18 and 2021-22, the July-June period, without any change in production over these years. As the old world order is challenged, countries again fear running out of food grains. Europe is being criticised for its farm-to-fork strategy promoting sustainable farming. A business standard analysis found food insecurity, the number of people with insufficient access to food, is a problem that was piling up for years when Russia-Ukraine crisis accentuated it. Data from food and agriculture organisations, the state of food security and nutrition in the world report shows that worldwide the number of moderately or severely food insecure people rose to 30.6% in 2020, compared to 22.6% in 2014. In Africa, food insecurity prevalence increased from 47.3% to 59.6% during this period, as countries across the continent focused on export crops instead of staples. Meanwhile, production has not been keeping pace with consumption. Data from the United States Department of Agriculture report shows that global consumption of corn, wheat and rice will outstrip production in the coming year. While this would not translate into shortages immediately, a sustained period of production and consumption gap may cause problems. Malthus's claims appear correct to some, but what he did not perceive was human capacity for innovation. With a few decades of his musings, mechanization improved farm productivity. So will technology come to the rescue again? Yaar? Mat pooch, yaar. फिर से स्टॉक्स में फंस गया। तो स्टॉक्स के साथ बॉन्ड्स, इंश्योरेंस, गोल्ड में बैलेंस कर। इसमें बहुत तामचा में। तुझे फाइव पैसा नहीं पता? अब तो सबको पता है। फाइव पैसा है ऑल इन वन अकाउंट। डाउनलोड फाइव पैसा नाउ। अब तो सबको पता है। Investing made easy and rewarding with five paisa. Investments in securities market are subject to market risks. Read all the related documents carefully before investing. Markets too are bleeding due to the war. Despite several attempts, the indices have failed to cling on to the gains and have succumbed to global and domestic hues. So should you use the current market fall to buy for the long term? Are the markets fully discounting the rate hikes by the RBI over the next few months? Our next segment takes a dive into it. It has been a choppy ride for the markets over the past few weeks. Despite several attempts, the indices have failed to cling to the gains and succumb to global and domestic cues. Analysts expect the markets to remain choppy in 2022, but there would be ample stock-specific opportunities all through the year, they suggest. However, analysts caution that timing the markets will not be a wise strategy at the current levels given the slew of domestic and global developments over the next few weeks. For instance, geopolitical developments related to the Russia-Ukraine war and its 
implications in commodity markets, especially oil and gas, will keep the global markets volatile. At home, the RBI's plans to hike rates may not have been fully discounted yet by the markets. Clearly, the response is not yet adequate to the inflation increase and therefore another 50 basis point increase uh, in the June credit policy is very likely. So, uh, if you look at the bond markets, uh, the 7.2% uh, percent tenure uh, GSEC has moved to about 7.4 to 7.5 and uh, next month it could be another 50 basis point higher. So, right now it is factoring in up to what happened uh, till the May meeting but it is obviously not yet factoring in the June increase. Well, there is no harm in uh, doing a weighted average buy on every decline, especially the blue chips, which have been resilient over time, over market and economy cycles. So therefore, uh, I don't see any issue because uh, our economy in general is doing well and there will be some amount of setback for six to nine months. But uh, as the market falls and the valuations become attractive, there is uh, no problem in uh, uh, buying the blue chips. I have earlier put out our target at uh, 14,660 for the Nifty and 17 times on uh, calendar 22 earnings. Sonal Verma of Nomura meanwhile says she expects a 50 basis points hike in June and 35 basis points in August and a terminal rate of 6.25% by April 23. However, rising fiscal risks will likely complicate the RBI's liquidity withdrawal strategy. Thus far in 2022, the S&P BSE Sensex and the Nifty 50 have lost around 7% each. The correction in the mid and small caps has been even sharper, with both the indices slipping 10% and 11% respectively on the BSE during this period. In the past week, however, there has been some pullback as the S&P, BSE Sensex and the Nifty 50 moved up nearly 2.5% each amid volatility. Analysts believe the recent pullback may still have some steam left. According to ICICI Securities, the current recovery for the Nifty may extend towards 17,000 levels. However, 15,600 will remain a very crucial level to watch out for. As regards inflation, analysts believe the government's measures to cut excise duty and petrol and diesel. As regards inflation, and measures to bring down the cost of cement and steel will be beneficial. Yet, inflation could remain substantially above the RBI's target range of 2 to 6%. On the contrary, any correction in oil and commodity prices might allay the inflation fears to some extent and present the trigger for an up move in the markets. Sunil Singhania of Abacus Asset Merger on his part believes that inflation has peaked. If our view on oil, commodity and inflation does come true, then there might be a surprise of interest rising less than expected, says Singhania. Any such possibility can be a key catalyst for a risk on and positive for equity markets, he says. With fundamentals continuing to be strong for India and now valuations also in line with 10-year averages, Singhania believes the risk reward for investors is only getting better. The asset manager continues to remain constructive on the markets. On Friday, the markets are likely to remain choppy in a range as they track domestic and global queues. Stock-specific action, however, will continue. Shares me trading. You don't know five paisa nahi pata? Oye, ab to sabko pata hai. Five paisa par milte hain research tools, portfolio analytics, or investment ideas bhi. Download five paisa now. Ab to sabko pata hai. Investing made easy and reporting with five paisa. Investments in securities market are subject to market risks. Read all the related documents carefully before investing. Not just the government and markets, people too are hit by rising inflation. And like the FMCG companies which resorted to shrinkflation, a set of consumers are now shifting to cheaper products due to soaring prices. It is called downgrading. Watch our next report to know more. It is a word that companies dread. Downtrading is a consumer behavior where buyers switch from an expensive or bigger product to either low unit packs or lower end brands. This can lead to a drop in volumes for FMCG companies. When high inflation puts the purchasing power of consumers under pressure, they resort to downtrading, be it in small ticket items like packaged consumer goods and food or vehicles and durables. 
Customers can either go for smaller packs of the same brand or for a more affordable brand in the same product category. Several major commodities such as crude oil, edible oils, wheat and steel have witnessed sharp inflation this year because of the Russia-Ukraine war. Faced with unprecedented raw material cost pressures, companies have hiked prices to the tune of 10 to 15% over the last 6 months, which include grammage reduction in items like soaps and snacks. Some categories have started seeing down trading by consumers. They are shifting to economy brands or smaller stock keeping units. The rural market has been witnessing a slowing demand scenario specifically in discretionary categories. In times like these, price sensitive customers go for no frills packs that satisfy their basic requirements. Manufacturers therefore sell the same products at different price points as down trading tests the brand loyalty of customers. By staying at various price points, companies can sell products that suit the price demanded by different customer segments. Products like soap, snacks and biscuits are priced as low as 1 or 5 rupees even though profit margins of companies take a hit at that level. This is done to retain market share when there is down trading. The expectation from companies is that when a customer down trades, he or she can choose the lower priced pack of the same brand rather than shift to a different brand. Customers opt for products with lower quality or fewer features to save some cash. But sometimes they can switch to an entirely different product that fulfills the same need. For example, one may switch from using a hand wash liquid to soap for washing hands or switch to a different type of vegetable oil for daily cooking if it is available at a lower price for the same quantity. With inflation compromising consumer wallet size, they are clearly giving more priority to essentials over discretionary items. Nation's trusted bank, SBI, the banker to every Indian. Hindustan Unilever recently said that the overall trend of down trading, where consumers are seeking value, has been very clearly established. That's all for today. We will be back with more news and analysis on our next episode. Stay tuned and thank you for watching. If you like this video, share it and subscribe to Business Standard. For more news, views and insights, log on to www.business-standard.com. Do also follow us on YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, Telegram and LinkedIn.